Hey everybody, it is uh, Brian Nemhauser and uh, apologies for those of you that were with me before and um, I had to uh, drop out. Um, the way I'm going to do this is uh, I'm going to go through, I, I'm sure you guys have some questions, I'm going to go through and give you my, um, my knowledge about training camp and things you're going to want to pay attention to. Um, you can ask questions about what I'm talking about as we go along. Um, and then toward the end, I'll take Q&A on kind of anything. I'm going to probably go through different position groups, uh, most of them on the team, and so we can talk about each player, each position that you have questions on. Could be here for a while, so buckle up, um, come in, stay, stay a while if you'd like. And um, I guess the way I'd start it is um, uh, when you're going to training camp, first thing is hopefully you got tickets already. Um, good luck. Uh, if you haven't, I know things, everything's sold out. Um, hey, everybody. Uh, I think um, a key thing there is um, if you're going on a weekday, it's great. It's a little less um, crazy than on the weekends, um, although, you know, with it being sold out, it's going to probably be not that much of a difference. Um, the other big thing to know with training camp is first thing. Now, this is a tip that most people don't know. You have to be there a while. First thing you do when you get there, you're trying to figure out where you're going to sit, where you're going to stand. Um, one thing you want to look for. Where are the big television, the big um, video cameras stationed? There will be two large um, uh, cherry pickers, I guess you call them, um, that that are stationed at one at, at an end zone and one is on the sideline. And wherever those are positioned, that is the field that training camp is going to take place on that day. There's actually three fields um, at the VMAC, and so one's far; it's toward the uh, it's toward the lake. One's the nearest, um, and then that's where most of them take place. And then there's one all the way to the side um, that's kind of the farthest from the actual VMAC. Um, if you see the cherry pickers set up um, on one of the fields that is, you know, the one that's farthest from the VMAC um, or the one, let's start with that. If it's from the one from the farthest from the VMAC, that's awesome because you basically get the same access that all the VIPs do. Um, there's really not a lot of difference. You'd be really close to the action. So it's a bonus if you get there on a day when the, the cherry pickers are all the way on the far there. A lot of people won't be smart enough, won't have experienced this before, and they'll just start setting up on the berm. Bad idea. You're far away from the action. If you see the things over there, you immediately want to start walking over to that far field. There's um, a few um, mini bleachers that you can stand on. You can get right up next to the field. So you want to get there right away. By the time practice starts, then everyone will realize and they'll start rushing over, but you'll already be in a good spot. If it's on the far field, the, the, the cherry pickers are set up on the far field. Um, again, most people just try to get closest as they can on the berm to get close to the field. Bad idea. You want to get farther back towards the top of the berm so you can actually see um, what's going on in the far field. If you get down to the bottom, what happens is uh, the players end up blocking your view. It's really hard to see, so you want to get a little bit higher. Um, if it's on the closest field, which is where most of the times training camp takes place, anywhere's fine. Um, getting right there close, that can be kind of cool if you want to talk to some of the reporters. You want to meet Danny O'Neill or Brock Hewitt or... Um, you know, maybe Mike Holmgren will be around, uh, Softy, those kind of guys. Um, for the most part, the reporters kind of keep to themselves. Um, you're not going to get that much chance to talk to players. You can kind of yell and they'll hear you, but um, if anything, being that close will get you uh, a chance to get autographs at the end if you're interested in that kind of thing. Um, in general, I personally like to be toward the top because that way I can get a bird's eye view of all the different things that are going on. The way training camp's organized is there's different stations. So the coaches, they'll run them through early drills. Honestly, the first half an hour of any training camp is, you know, it's, it's stretching, it's warm-ups, it's individual drills, um, not a lot of interesting stuff. But they'll break out with their position coaches. Linebackers will go one place, receivers will go another place. Um, and you want to kind of have a chance to see all the different action going on. Um, I think the real interesting parts are when they start breaking into, uh, you know, position versus position. So one of my favorites uh, is when they do pass rush drills. And so this will be something most people don't pay attention to. Um, most people will probably watch 7v7, and, and I'll talk to you about that in a second. But what's great about pass rushing drills is that is where you find 
real future talent. So you find a defensive lineman going up against, uh, let's say a defensive end, going up against an offensive uh, tackle, and you see how quickly the guy gets off the ball, you see what kind of pass rush moves he gets, and you see how that tackle performs against him. So you're getting in that instance a real NFL view of what it's like to rush the passer, how these guys are, how quick they are off the ball, how powerful they are, and how they do against elite um, uh, you know, um, opponents. So you get that with edge rushers. They also do interior rushing. So this is going to be a key for this camp. How are those centers doing against the likes of Michael Bennett, um, against uh, Ataba Rubin, um, Brandon Meebane? How are they holding up? That's going to be a really interesting thing to see. Um, how does, is Justin Britt any better? This is where, for me, this is where I found Alvin Bailey. And I was like, holy shit, this guy does not get beat on pass rushing drills by just about anybody. Nobody beats him. Um, this is where I saw Justin Britt and was like, uh, we've got a problem. This guy can't block really anybody. And if you try to block Cliff Averill, it's just over. So um, really important. That happens about halfway through practice most of the times. Um, and uh, uh, I think the other piece that's going on that, that's tempting to watch there and is also really valuable is 7v7. So that 7v7 is when you basically have um, on offense – You'll have uh, the quarterback, you'll have receivers, tight ends, um, the running backs going up against uh, really the linebackers and the secondary. You don't have any linemen involved in that. It's a good way to see how the receivers and the cornerbacks are going versus, versus each other. Um, and I think you'll, you'll see how um, it, training camp's a place that you can actually see how a cornerback and how a receiver um, are going to measure up. You can see how well receivers do in terms of in and out of their breaks. Do they get separation? Are they open? Even if they're not getting the ball thrown to them, are they getting separation? Um, you can also see where there's different uh, opportunities for, for miscommunication and are the receivers actually physically talented, but you can tell by the way that they return to the huddle. Do the coaches talk to them? Were they running the wrong route? Were they in the wrong place? A lot of times you learn as much by how coaches interact with the players as you do by watching the actual performance on the field. Um, another thing you're going to want to pay attention to is it's a bonus. If it's a padded day, you know, if they come out, usually they're going to be wearing their helmets and they're going to be wearing shorts. If they come out and they're wearing their pads and they're wearing their, their, their padded pants, then you're in for a treat. That's closer to real practice. That's closer to real contact. You're going to get goal line drills that day. You're going to get a little bit more activity. Um, red zone becomes more realistic. And if you've got pads on, then you can actually start judging running backs. You can start judging um, uh, linebackers and, and defensive linemen and, and all those kinds of things. So that's a pretty important piece uh, to play into things there. Um, uh, if you don't have uh, pads on, that's most of the days you're not going to have pads on. It's okay. You're still going to see stuff that's valuable. But um, you know, keep an eye, uh, keep an eye on special teams practice as well. So that'll break um, usually in the middle of practice. They'll sometimes start with that. It, it, it varies. They might have changed their formula this year and their schedule. But um, Tyler Lockett, guy to watch absolutely this year. How does he look catching um, uh, kickoffs, punt returns, um, and Key thing here, folks. Now, this is this is for the hardcore people. This is not for the, you know, just going to sit in the sun. You want to have an idea of what's going to happen at the 53-man roster cut down? Who's in the first team on special teams? That matters. If Michael Morgan is still in the first team on special teams, um, even though, you know, there's all these other younger linebackers and there's young safeties and there's other players that could potentially get in there, that tells you that maybe, okay, well, if Kevin Norwood is not participating in, in special teams or is not in a prominent role, his chances of making the team are less um, than if he is participating in special teams. So really, you don't have to watch it to see, like, how are they doing? Watch it to see when you go to training camp. One of the things is there's different rotations. So pay attention in each drill. Who is the first up? Who is the second up? And they usually go in groups so that you will actually start to see the depth chart start to get built out even before they publish anything. Um, for example, who's the first, the, the, the base unit defensive line, something I'm always looking at. Who's lining up at, at one end? Cliff Averill will be on one side. Um, who's opposite Cliff Averill? Is it always Michael Bennett, or is Frank Clark getting some run with the number one unit? Um, inside, Brandon Meebane should be the starting nose tackle. If he's not, who do they th consider the backup nose tackle? Is it Ataba Rubin? Um, is it Jordan Hill? Is it 
DeAnthony Smith. Like, who, who would they consider a nose tackle? That's an important thing for us. Is Jimmy Staten getting run there? That would be a big deal to find, find that out. Who's the three technique? Is Tony McDaniel still the starter there? Or are they putting a Ruben, a Taba Rubin in there? Or um, is someone else getting snaps? So you want to see that base lo- defensive line. And then when they get into third down situations, you'll see them switch out and bring in a nickel package. Also important. So at that point, you'll be able to see, sorry, I'm making you nauseous. Um, you're going to be able to see uh, who is their rush package. Who is their default rush package? So they'll bring in, um, you know, they'll have Averill on one side. They'll probably have Irvin on the other side. And then you're going to have... Bennett probably in the middle, um, and thank you Seahawks for dive. Nice of you to say. Um, and I'm guessing Ruben is the other interior rusher. I don't know. I'm going to be looking at that. And when they do those drills, they'll have that first unit, and then they will flip it over. They'll flip to the next unit. So you're going to see who's the second on the depth chart at all those positions. I personally, I'm writing all that stuff down. So when you read my training camp notes, most of what I'm writing down is who's the first unit, who's the second unit. What are the sub packages? So sub packages for people that are just learning, sub packages are like nickel or like dime situations or you know specialty situations where you know where Michael Bennett may be in the base defense, he's playing a defensive end. In a sub package, he's usually playing on the interior line. So um, getting to understand that tells you a lot about what's going on. If you happen to be going for more than one day, being able to compare one day to another and seeing has the has the rotation changed. That's a key aspect of what goes on. So um, those are some key things to pay attention to. Other little tips. Uh, it is hot there. There is no shade. Make sure you bring sun, sun, um, sunscreen, sunglasses, a hat. You know, with, with uh, what I got going on up here, I definitely am um, bringing a hat. Um, and, uh, you know, if you haven't already, check out the, the handout that I um, added to my blog. Um, it is a list of all 90 players on the roster, their numbers, their height, their weight, um, and a player note about each one of them. And this is great if you're bringing people that um, uh, you're bringing people that are not as familiar with the Seahawks, haven't been to these things before. Give them these things, and they can download it. Uh, they can print it out, you know, and have something that can help guide them on the way. Um, bring some extras. I think you can hand those out. Uh, it's just a great way to meet other people because generally people want to have that. Um, so I think those are the key things that, that I'd bring up for training camp. As I said earlier in one of my earlier broadcasts, make sure you listen to the three horns. The best part, the best part of training camp is the end of the practice. If you pack up and leave early to try to beat people to the bus, that's fine. But just know you're going to miss the scrimmage. You're going to miss seeing the closest to real game action. You're going to miss seeing the part where, honestly, I don't mind getting, I sometimes arrive to training camp practices uh, half an hour late because the first half an hour to really an hour of training camp isn't all that valuable to see. It's really uh, the last 45 minutes that I'm paying very close attention to what's going on. Um, by the way, another drill, uh, favorite drill of mine is to watch uh, receivers versus cornerback 1v1. Um, generally a huge advantage for the receiver. If you see a cornerback that's actually able to stick with a receiver in 1v1 drills, a pretty big deal and pretty impressive um, as the case may be. So um, uh, if there's questions about specific training camp stuff, um, we can talk about that. Otherwise, I'm going to start going through the different position groups and talk about different folks that I'll be watching. I'm going to try to do a broadcast either on Periscope or via podcast. Um, Each morning, I'll cover one position group um, or two and then um, roll that all the way up into training camp. Um, And uh, as always, um, I publish, as soon as um, training camp's over, um, I publish notes that day, um, giving you my perspective on who broke out, who didn't, um, things that I like, things that I didn't. Um, I do some things well, I do some things not so well. In general, um, I've had a pretty good track record of finding some, some uh, early uh, indicators of guys that are going to be successful for the Seahawks and guys you should pay attention to. So um, all, you know, pride, uh, I guess... Um, all ego aside, I would just say um, that's something to check out. I think it's valuable, um, and uh, I stand behind that work. So um, it's a good way to kind of keep up if you aren't going to get to go to training camp. Um, so uh, I'll start answering questions as they come up. Otherwise, I'm going to start going through position groups here. So um, uh, first one here would be offensive line. Um, I think this is the key to the key Seahawks season this year is going to be how are the Seahawks set up at offensive line. 
And um, clearly the, the big battle to focus on there is going to be at center. You've got Lemula Jean-Pierre, who is the odds-on favorite. You've got Drew Nowak, who is um, splitting time with the ones as OTAs ended. Um, and then you've got a guy like uh, uh, Patrick Lewis, who started last year um, some games at center, but really hasn't been heard of much. So I'm going to be really paying attention to where those three guys are in the depth chart, who runs out with the ones, who's with the twos. Are they rotating each day? Um, when they set up the quarterback competition between Russell Wilson, Tavares Jackson, uh, Matt Flynn, uh, they rotated who was the starter each day. If they've got a three-way competition, don't be surprised if they do something similar like that here. So if the first day Lemuel Jean-Pierre is the starter, that doesn't necessarily mean he's the odds-on guy. could mean that the next day uh, we see Drew Nowak running out with the, the starter. So the first week, a lot of the times they're going to let that stuff play out. And then... Um, uh, it's interesting to see kind of how those rotations look. Really hard to judge offensive linemen from a blocking standpoint in uh, training camp practices, honestly, from a run p- situation, which, to be honest, that's where Tom Cable cares the most uh, about how a team's doing and how a uh, lineman's doing. Um, but you will at least know where they think things are by who's the top of the rotation. Um, I think another guy that I'm kind of curious about whether he's going to play a role at center is Mark Lewinsky. There hasn't been any talk about this. This is coming purely from me. Um, I I basically, I think that there's a lot of potential with Lewinsky. I think he's very athletic. I think he's great at guard. Um, I think that uh, they obviously thought highly of him where they drafted him. Um, And it makes me just wonder if uh, he's going to sneak his way into that center battle. So I'm going to be seeing if he's taking any snaps. Um, That could be a dark horse uh, to get involved in that uh, position battle. At the guard situation, um, you're going to have a, a situation there where if Patrick Lewis, for example, is not really in the top two of the depth chart for center, then he has to beat some people out for guard. You've got a pretty um, stacked guard um, uh, group. You've got J.R. Sweezy. You've got Alvin Bailey, who's, um, I think, the odds-on favorite to be the starting left guard after being a tackle in most cases um, since coming into the league. He played guard in college. He actually played both guard positions in college and was good enough at run blocking back then that they'd actually switch him to which side they were planning on running. It was a little bit of a tell, but he is a a road grading guard back then. He's not been um, uh, as much that for the Seahawks. Um, And so he's actually been a better pass blocker than he has been a a run blocker. I think I said pass. I mean pass blocker. Um, But so you've got Alvin Bailey, you've got J.R. Sweezy that are the uh, odds on favorites to start. Then you've got Terry Poole, who is a tackle in college, who's been uh, converted to guard. Glowinski, who is a natural guard. You've got um, Patrick Lewis, who I just mentioned, um, will play uh, um, some guard. You've got uh, Kevon Milton, who's a 324-pound big boy, was on the um, uh, practice squad last year. You've got Kona Schwenke, um, who was uh, someone that impressed enough that they decided to sign him. Um, and... You know, there's a potential you see uh, Chris John Socoli at guard. Um, they brought him on to play center. Um, I should have brought him up in the center conversation. I think my, my feeling there is uh, Socoli is a, a project. In all likelihood, he's a guy that's a practice squad member. Um, but there's been whispers that he's a little farther along in his conversion than J.R. Sweezy was at the same time. I take that with a grain of salt because J.R. Sweezy was uh, converting to play guard. And there's a lot less to focus on there. Converting to play center, where you're going to have to know, uh, hey, Zane, nice to have you. Um, uh, converting to play center, where you're going to have to do line calls, handle snaps, um, shotgun snaps, all that kind of stuff. Um, it's a little hard to believe that someone would be uh, ready to really start um, as a rookie uh, switching to that position. But um, I think Sicoli could get some time at guard. Um, and Joseph, I can't tell you where I heard whispers, but, uh, uh, I've heard whispers. So, uh, take it for what it is. Um, so anyway, I think the guard position, the interesting thing there is, you know, Patrick Lewis, if he is not in the top two in center, if he wants to make this team, he better be in the top four in guard, um, rotations. So, uh, I have not heard anything about Terry Poole. I'm eager to see what he looks like. He seems, he seems more built like a tackle. Um, I'm not sure what he's going to look like at guard. But um, we'll kind of see how he moves. Um, I think when you're watching a lineman in training camp, you know, they do some drills where Cable will have them um, dive into uh, pads and onto a cushion. 
Um, and the point of that drill is just to kind of teach them how to cut block. Um, and uh, that's helpful to see because you can really see the athleticism of the guards and see how people move when they're doing that. Um, uh, another guard that I, I did not mention and I should and also could fit into the center situation is uh, Will Parasak. I think it's Parasak or Parakak. Uh, I can't say I, I know for sure. Um, but he's a converted player as well. So um, lots of guys at guard. I think this is a team that knows that J.R. Sweezy is a, a free agent after this year and just lost James Carpenter, and they have to start building some guard depth. Seems like they've got some potential to do that. Um, as far as uh, tackles go, um, really intriguing group there. So uh, you've got Russell Okung, who's very likely in his last year with the Seahawks. You've got Justin Britt, who was a liability as a pass protector and um, now has become uh, into his second year. Full year as a starter. This will be his first full off season. We'll see if he's kind of come into his own is all. I don't, I don't know how much we'll see progress there. I'm, I'm really hopeful, but but we'll see. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Zane. That's actually a, a confetti from the, the field as well. So uh, I like looking at that every day. Um, but you've got uh, two solid starters, I would say, at tackle. Um, guys at least have started for you for Super Bowl quality teams. Um, and then you've got some interesting prospects. So um, Alvin Bailey is always a backup. He's proven he can play left tackle, which is an amazing thing to have, a backup left tackle who maybe he's not starting quality there, but he's He's close. He's a he's pretty good in pass protection, and that's where left tackles can really get eaten alive if they're if they're not capable. Um, and then you've got some interesting prospects. So Gary Gilliam, um, very athletic, out of Penn State, converted tight end, um, caught a touchdown pass last year against Green Bay. Um, what's he going to look like? Um, how is he going to play? I think that there's some reason to believe that they want to see if he can be the heir apparent to Russell Okung. Where is he on the depth chart? Um, at left tackle? Is he getting reps at left tackle or is he only on the right side? Um, those are things I want to see. I see Gilliam as a guy um, who's who's a little bit more, he's definitely more athletic than a guy like Justin Britt. Not a mauler. He's a little lengthier, a little lankier. Um, and so I, I'm kind of intrigued to see if he's good enough to, um, you know, get some reps uh, at left tackle and what he looks like there. Um, Terry Poole is a guy that, again, is supposed to be playing guard. Be curious how he's getting reps to tackle and at which which side. Another guy to watch there that's interesting and got some uh, got some play from Tom Cable was um, Jesse Davis. So Jesse Davis is a rookie out of Idaho, got signed as an undrafted free agent, um, and uh, made some made some waves at rookie minicamp. So um, another guy to kind of watch. I have not seen Jesse yet. He's six six, three hundred pounds. Um, so he's, he's again, a, a long lean guy, um, sounds athletic. I'm kind of excited to see what he looks at. So, you know, offensive linemen are not what most people go to watch, uh, go to training camp to watch. I'm telling you, that is the difference between this team being great and this team being, you know, very good this year. Um, and the ability of them to hold up is going to be pretty important. Um, and one of the things you're going to see, the ways to judge that when they get into, to, First of all, in the 1v1 press dress drills, that's a key way to see. Um, it is our biggest question, Joseph, for sure. No doubt about it, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and then uh, the other places when they get into scrimmage, especially if they have pads on, you will see it really quickly. What will happen is if the defensive linemen are way better, and like the offensive linemen aren't holding up, you're, you're going to see plays that can't even get off, throws that can't be completed, um, Russell running like crazy, and I think most of you think, or a lot of folks think he's just running like crazy because the offensive line sucks all the time. It's just not the case. Um, uh, you'll know it. You'll see it. Guys just breaking through. If they're getting time, if they're getting a clean pocket, that's a really positive sign. Um, and you want to pay attention to who, who the linemen are that are in when they get those clean pockets to throw and what that looks like. Um, in order of, of kind of biggest camp questions, so I started with offensive line. I think the next is, is Earl Thomas. Is he going to be there? Is he going to suit up? Is he going to play? And if not, um, what's the situation at safety? Um, so Deshaun Shedd should be the starting free safety opposite Cam Chancellor. Um, after that, who's next? So if I look through this list, um, and apologies for looking down, I just have to take a look at some of my notes. Um, Dion Bailey is listed as a free safety. Um, you've got Stephen Terrell and uh, Tristan Wade. Um, Wade's a rookie. 
Uh, Bailey's a guy that is is intriguing. Uh, I think he's a he's definitely a different kind of safety than Earl. He's not a, a sideline to sideline guy as much. A little more physical. Um, um, just checking his weight. Yeah, he's two eleven. You know, uh, Earl's about two hundred. So he's definitely the biggest of the safeties at uh, the free safeties. But he's really he's instinctual. Um, I like him a lot. I think he's a good special teams player. He got hurt last year. He was one of the guys I was really watching. Um, has a way of creating some turnovers. Kind of wonder if he's a, a guy that could fit in as a third safety, uh, kind of Jerron Johnson role. But, um, you know, keep an eye out for him. Uh, Tristan Wade's gotten a little bit of, of play. I think there's been some talk about him, so I'll be wanting to watch him. He's uh, number 38. Um, and again, uh, <laughs> and again, thanks, Zane. So, again, you're going to want to download that roster um, off my website. Uh, I'm telling you, it's really hard to follow 90 players, all new players, a lot of them new, without knowing the numbers um, and without having some notes about those guys. So I recommend you do that. But um, that'll be an interesting thing to watch. So who's playing free safety? Who's second? So Deshaun Shedd's the obvious for first. Who's number two? Who's number three? That's going to be instructive. That's something to pay attention to. Um, Next level of interest for me is pass rushers, right? So let's see where they are with pass rushers. Who is the starters there? And let's take a look um, at defensive ends. So, uh, sorry, I'm scrolling through here, taking a look at a couple. Um, we know that we've got um, Cliff Averill. We know that we've got Michael Bennett. Um, first thing I'll be looking for is, is Michael Bennett, Bennett still a base defensive end? Um, I would think he is. He plays five technique, which is the one that Red Bryant used to play. It's more of a you know, anchor run stuffing kind of uh, defensive end in this defense. But Michael Bennett obviously also can rush the passer. So he's a better two-way player than Red Bryant ever was. And what most people don't know, he's actually a better run defender than Red Bryant was at defensive end. Um, but uh, one, is Michael Bennett going to be there early? Two, if he is, is he still the starting five technique? Three, if not, um, is Frank Clark getting reps there? My gut is that they're going to try to find if Frank Clark can at least be a rotational player at five technique, which will allow Michael Bennett to get more rest, be more fresh for pass rushing situations, um, and move around the line more. He, you know, there might be times they put him at three technique um, in base defense, um, create a little extra pass rush, still a good run defender, um, and have Frank Clark out there at the edge. So Frank Clark's a absolute key figure in this. Um, and Frank Clark, uh, let's see if I've got his number here. Frank Clark is number 55. So you're going to want to keep an eye for 55. Um, where is he playing? How often is he playing? Where in the depth chart is he? And key with Clark is, is he always outside? My gut is he will be outside on base defense like Michael Bennett. I'm thinking he's going to be the number two five technique defensive end behind Michael Bennett to start with in the base defense. Then when they go to nickel, where does he play inside? Um, I assume Michael Bennett's number one, um, on the interior kind of three tech uh, defensive rush, defense tackle rush position. Um, is Frank Clark number two? Probably not. Um, maybe. Uh, where does Jordan Hill fit into that picture? Is Jordan Hill getting any reps with the base defense? I don't think so. He's just not a good enough run defender to play, you know, the early downs. Um, but how is. I assume he and Michael Bennett are going to be our interior rushers. That leaves the exterior to be Bruce Irvin and Cliff Averill, most likely. It's a nice nickel uh, pass rush package. Bruce Irvin on the left, usually. Um, Cliff Averill on the right. Michael Bennett next to Cliff Averill. Jordan Hill next to um, Bruce Irvin. Uh, a nice group there. Another possibility is that you've got a Taba Rubin in there in nickel situations as a rusher next to someone like Michael Bennett or next to Jordan Hill. Um, then you've got a guy, guys like uh, uh, Obum Guachem, who is a total project, but supposed to be incredibly athletic. I think he's more of a practice squad possibility, but, but someone to pay attention to. Um, the guy there is Cassius Marsh. Uh, uh, I've talked about him a lot. If you watch this, you know I've talked about him a lot. What's he going to look like? What's he going to do? Um, where do they have him? Um, I think last year they, you know, they definitely switched him between inside and outside. I think he's going to be exclusively outside this time around. Um, at what position? Is he playing base defense? I don't think so because he's only 250. So um, if he is, he'd be probably number two um, at the Leo position behind Cliff Averill because Cliff Averill's around the same weight. Um, 
I don't think he'll, I think, you know, Frank Clark will likely be on the opposite side. Most likely what you'll see is uh, the second unit come in, Frank Clark will be where Michael Bennett was. Um, Cassius Marsh will be where Cliff Averill was. That's most likely the case for the second unit um, base defensive line. Um, and then uh, you've got a lot, Greg Scruggs is another guy. I don't know where he's going to fit in this. Um, the guy's got talent. There's no doubt about it. He's athletic. He can play inside and outside, no doubt about it. He's, you know, he's a natural 280, 290 guy. Um, it can be up to 300, carry that weight really easily. Um, and we'll see how they play him. I think he's going to be closer to, um, you know, in the 290 range this time around. Um, this is his make or break. Uh, the guy had a couple sacks as a rookie. Um, seemed like he was destined to kind of grow into becoming a, a nice role player. Uh, we'll see where he fits um, at this point. Um, and then you're going to have other players. I'm going to take a look here and see if there's other guys that I wanted to bring up. Um, those are the key ones on the pass rush side. Uh, I'm scrolling through here real quick. Um, other ones that could play a role, kind of curious how they use um, on the linebacker situation, kind of fl flipping over to linebackers. Kevin Pierre-Lewis, um, you know, does he get an opportunity to rush the passer a little bit? Um, if he is playing Sam linebacker like Bruce Irvin, do they also see that he's got any ability to kind of rush the edge? Um, not necessarily as a defensive end, but, you know, off of base defense, you know, can he come off the edge? Can he seal the edge? Um, that's going to be an interesting thing to see for, for KPL. He's a really light guy. I have trouble seeing him as a Sam linebacker. You know, at 230, um, I think he is more built to be a weak side linebacker than where K.J. Wright plays. I think K.J. Wright's actually a better Sam you know, linebacker body type, um, but, but, you know, they like him at the will position. Um, other guys to watch, I mean, linebacker is just stocked. Um, the guys that I'm going to kind of pay attention to there, Brock Coyle, um, really forgotten guy, undrafted free agent out of Montana last year, won the backup middle linebacker role, solid guy there, um, really good run defender, interested to see how he does um, special teams wise. If he's on the first you know, first team special teams, that's a good sign for him. That's a very good sign for him. Um, that pretty much guarantees him a spot. Um, if he's not, you know, it's a little bit more questionable. I think he's pretty safe um, overall. Uh, you know, you've got Bobby Wagner. You've got K.J. Wright. Um, uh, Mike Morgan's a guy that I think is, is going to be challenged for a roster spot this year. He's been a core special teams guy. If he's not on the first unit special teams, he's good as gone. So, um, we'll, we'll see if any of the other younger linebackers or younger players can kind of push him off the spot there. Um, you know, Eric Pinkins is the, the other piece that, that uh, I have a lot of interest in. Um, again, he's a lighter player, was drafted to be a cornerback, um, was then moved to safety, then got hurt, played safety in college, and now um, they've got him at linebacker. And I think he's generally playing the Malcolm Smith kind of linebacker role which naturally is more of a weak side linebacker like K.J. Wright's position. Um, that's where Malcolm really excelled. Um, they had Malcolm play Sam um, some, but that was not his best position by any stretch. Um, where more Malcolm really excelled was in coverage. Um, he's a lighter, quicker player. I think that's where um, a guy like Pinkins can really stand out. He's also strong, and he's, he's supposedly, like his San Diego State coach said, he was the best special teams player he's ever coached. So, you know, I, I can't keep stressing that enough that your performance on special teams has everything to do with your spot on the, the roster if you're a young player. So um, seeing how Eric Pinkins, you know, fits on special teams is every bit, if not more important, than how he plays at linebacker. Um, if he does great on special teams, they will find a way, um, if any way, for him to be a valuable as a positional player for something like linebacker. Um, Moving on down, um, and again, if you guys have questions, please feel free to jump in. I'll, I'll tackle those as they come through. Let's talk about running backs for a second. Um, so I think, you know, Marshawn Lynch is clearly the favorite. Uh, <laughs> not going to surprise anyone with that. He's going to be the starter. Uh, Marshawn's a fun guy to watch at camp. He plays around with the defensive linemen as much as he plays around with anyone on offense. Um, he actually goes through defensive line drills. Um, and... You know, there's not a lot to watch with the running backs. I think what I pay attention to is how are their hands. So it's something to, to pay attention to in terms of situations where the ball is thrown to them. Thomas Rawls getting a lot of um, uh, attention and questions about where he fits and is he going to push for backup, you know, reps. 
I gotta be honest, folks, I think that's a load of shit. Like, not that it's impossible that Thomas Rawls is gonna be there, but the fact that he's getting buzz after rookie camp and OTAs, like, you can't judge a running back without pads against rookies, you know, walking around in shorts. Like, you just can't. So, um, until there's pads on, until there's, you know, you can see how he's dealing with getting hit um, a little bit, that's one level. Really, until you get into a preseason game and see how he goes against real competition that wants to knock him out, I think it's really hard to say any of the, the new running backs have, like, established themselves as interesting players. I think we have to pay attention. Um, I think you can learn by, again, where they are on the depth chart. Is Thomas Rawls coming onto the field before Christian Michael? That will tell you something. Robert Turbin's in the last year of his contract. He's coming off a hip surgery. He's supposed to be there. Is he there? Or is this one of Pete Carroll's, you know, you know, happy-go-lucky, everything's great, but he's actually not great, and he's not playing right away, and maybe one week becomes two weeks, and you start to have a question of if Turbin's going to be a PUP guy. I don't think that's the case, but we'll, we'll have to find out. Um, I think Kristen Michaels, you know, he's on his last leg. Uh, he has to come in. I was pretty disappointed to see that he missed a fair amount of OTAs. Um, uh, and um, sorry, there's a question about what Turbin's going to make this year. Um, I can look that up in a second. But if you want to go to overthecap.com, that's where I check out my salary stuff. Um, you can find uh, Robert Turbin's salary numbers there pretty quickly. Um, I think uh, Kristen Michael... I, everyone, Softy harasses me about this all the time. I'm not going to back down from the fact that he is, I would say, the guy with the potential to have the most rushing yards of any running back on this roster. Yes, that includes Marshawn Lynch. No, it does not mean I think he's better than Marshawn Lynch. He is a high yards per carry running back. He's a guy that, you know, when he gets chances, he's a five yards per carry and greater running back. Those are rare. Those are very rare. He is athletically measures up with a guy like Adrian Peterson. Um, there's very, very few players that match up at that athletic level. I've seen him in the open field. He has the ability to turn short runs into long runs. So he's got all the talent in the world. The only thing that holds him back is what's up here. And I think he's been battling Tom Cable. I don't think he listens. I don't think he does what Tom Cable wants him to do. And Cable is, has a big old doghouse, and he's not afraid to throw you into it. So, you know, Christian Michael's got to make peace with Tom Cable. He's got to get himself on the field. And then, when he's done that, he's got to hold on to the damn ball. He does have a fumble problem. He has dropped the ball. You know, in the few chances he's got, he's fumbled the ball too much. He fumbled it in preseason last year. He fumbled it during the regular season. That is a surefire way to be off the team. So, um, you know... Make or break thing, the most important thing, most important thing for Kristen Michael is stay on the field. Don't get injured. Show up every day. Do what you're told. And hopefully, you know, he, he shows out in the preseason games and he goes, does the things he's supposed to do. And we all get to see a fantastic player play. Um, that's what I'm cheering for, you know. Um, I think he's an incredibly explosive athlete that can add a lot to this team. And... There are players like that that just come and go because they cannot figure out how to break into the rotation. They can't figure out how to be a pro. And so Christian Michael's got to figure out how to be a pro. As far as Turbin goes, you know, my thoughts on him is he is a better player last year than I thought he was. Um, he's in the last year of his deal. I don't expect them to re-sign him. Um, and I'm not all that broken up about that. I think he's a great guy. I cheer for him. I don't think he's a difference-making running back. I think he's a backup. I think it's easy to find backup running backs. And is there a slight chance that, that someone like Thomas Rawls or Rod Smith or someone like that, you know, beats him out? Unlikely because the coaching staff and the players love Robert Turbin. Um, but, uh, you know, if he's hurt, if he's not able to get on the field, then maybe. I mean, um, maybe that becomes a possibility. So um, let's see. Any other position groups people want me to touch on? Um, I can go through. I've got talked about offensive line. Let's talk about tight end for a second. Um, so, uh, Jimmy Graham. Really curious to see. Uh, does he play mostly tight end or does he play wide receiver? I have this gut instinct that he's going to play receiver a lot, which is going to mean we might see situations where Jimmy Graham's on the field. I'm going to be looking for is Jimmy Graham on the field 
with Luke Wilson and with Anthony McCoy. So in that situation, you normally would call that a three tight end set. Three tight end sets are heavies. That's when you're bringing in to run. I think this could be a three tight end set you see that is a pass centric set. Jimmy Graham split out wide. Luke Wilson is a, a good receiver. Um, and then you can also potentially have another receiver out there. You could have two receivers, two tight ends. That could be a really interesting set for the team this year. Um, and I want to see how they play that out. If Jimmy Graham is getting a lot of rep at receiver, which I expect him to, that increases the chances that the team keeps four tight ends. Um, they usually keep three. Um, but I kind of see Jimmy Graham as different than Luke Wilson, different than Anthony McCoy, different than Cooper Helfett or Rashawn Allen. So um, there's a potential that they keep four tight ends, which would give Cooper Helfett, Rashawn Allen, someone like that, a chance to make the squad. As far as receivers go, I think that's the last group I'll cover tonight. Um, Doug Baldwin is, is your number one guy. Um, and uh, I think beyond that, uh, you know, Jimmy Graham, like I said, I think is going to be essentially a number one kind of receiver with him. Um, where they play together, how do they play together? Is Doug on the inside playing slot? Is Jimmy on the inside playing slot? Um, that's going to be a key aspect. Um, Jermaine Kirsch, assume that he's starting opposite of Doug. Um, is he? Uh, I, I would assume so. But is Chris Matthews splitting reps with him? Key thing to watch. Is Douglas McNeil? Where is he? This is a guy I'm fascinated by. Built like a, you know, he's really a, a fine athlete. Um, six foot three, 200 pounds, um, really interesting player. I'm going to see how he plays out. Um, and then you've got Tyler Lockett, folks. I mean, this is a guy that could be a difference maker in space, um, could get some of the Percy Harvin style um, cloud, you know, uh, you know, bubble screens, things like that. Um, and I think he's got the potential to be a good outside receiver. So it can be interesting to see how that plays out. Um, all right. I'm going to wrap it up there. Been on for a while. Appreciate you guys sticking with me. I um, uh, love having you on. Um, I'll be on each morning uh, this week, giving you some more insights into each different position group and different things I'll be looking at. And uh, if you have any questions, always hit me up. I'm happy to answer. Take care, everybody.